This will be our second lesson in the book of Philemon. As we go through this book, I want to do my best to correlate it with other various doctrines and teachings and perspectives of Scripture. Because all Scripture is set within the purpose of God, and given some diligence, you can you can make some associations as we go through this text with some very wonderful truths. And we're at the point where Paul is addressing the letter to certain people. And the manner in which Paul addresses people is, is, is significant. It's worthy of some uh, ex extended consideration how he introduces himself to the people of God, how he addresses them. It's necessary to draw attention to this because Babylon the Great has changed the way believers address one another. Yeah. It's, it's de-spiritualized it, if I may use that coin a term, so that they don't see each other like that God intends for them to see each other. They don't speak to each other like God intends for them to speak. They don't address each other like God intends, intends them to address. So God's not going to work in that kind of situation. It's really important to see that. That the way people of God address each other, think of each other, provides a sort of an environment in which God can work. It develops a, a consciousness of, the, of what the people of God are, what a marvelous display of God's grace they are. And if, a, if that's missed, mm -hmm. things just shut down. That, that's just the way it is. It's because of this distorted view of God and the, this distorted way of addressing the people of God that, that gradually in that context a, a distorted view of God has arisen yeah. and a distorted view of the people of God has arisen. Amen. So there have been doctrines built around this distorted view. Like that God sees everybody alike. God can overlook your sin. Why do those views arise? It's partly owing to the way people see the people of God, how they speak to them. They, this, is how they th this is how they think, mm -hmm. and they've imposed that yeah. thinking upon God. That's so what he thought that way. Paul speaks to the saints that he addresses them in a manner that complements and enlarges upon the salvation of God. He knows that there's a, where there's a personal affection for the people of God, which is, I can't overstate how this is practically defunct mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in our day. Why don't people gather together? They don't have an affection for each other. Let's just call it what it is. That's what the trouble is. And when you see each other properly and develop an affection for one another, that's what knits the people together. Amen. Because that affection provokes speech and provokes comfort and consolation, exhortation. See, that's what knits us together. But where the people of God aren't seen correctly, they aren't going to be knit together. That's, right. yeah, that's just the way it is. They'll be scattered. They'll have a preference for one another. It's because the scripture teaches preferring one another. If they don't have a preference for one another, they're not going to minister to one another. And if they don't minister to one another, the body of Christ is not going to be built up. And if the body of Christ is not built up, it'll get weaker. And if it gets weaker, the world gets stronger. And Satan gets more potent. See, this, this is serious stuff we're talking about here. And there's very few people that see it. In fact, if you find anybody that sees it, shake their hand and give them a hug because you found a very rare situation. See, it's the church's fault that the world's in the shape it's in. This can be traced back to the pillar and ground of the truth closing its mouth and being married to the world, and the world is her wedded name. 
She's the mother. Babylon is the mother of the abominations of the earth. It's because religion went downhill. That's why the world's going downhill. It's not because of the Muslims or the Egyptians. So Paul addresses his the saints of God in unique ways. Like he'll call them to the faithful in Christ Jesus, as Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Or he'll call them the saints. Yeah, it's just something that makes you feel kind of edified to be called a saint. He calls them the faithful brethren in Christ, Colossians 1. Or the beloved of God, Romans 1.5. Or called to be saints, Romans 1.7. Or them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, as 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Or all the saints, 2 Corinthians 1, 1. Or the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God and in the Lord Jesus Christ, as 1 Thessalonians 1, 1. Or Timothy, my own son in the faith. How would you feel if Paul said that to you? Huh? It builds you up, see. Or Timothy, my dearly beloved son. Or Titus, my own son after the common faith. See, Paul's writings are a demonstration of the spirit mm -hmm. of Christ. Yeah. And they, they evidence the potency of, of illumination as to what God has done in, in people. Marvelous to consider. a day, one day a week theory out of the water because if the spirit is really in you, then it will show forth all the time. Yeah, these these people aren't even real. These are frauds. They're blotches on the canvas of divine working. Yes, sis, Brother Jeremy. Yeah, you can't stop people from doing what they love. I mean... When they love right. something, I mean, when they don't like something, they can put up with it for an hour or whatever. But when they love something, you can't stop them. They just, when they just can't get enough yeah. of it. Now, now, I gave you some examples of the way Paul addressed certain churches. But now, when he addressed Galatia, he didn't say that. That's right. He didn't say any of that mm -hmm. when he addressed Galatia. Then after he identified himself, the first thing he said was, I marvel that you are so soon moved from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel. That's his introduction to the Galatians. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what he'd say today to most churches. He wouldn't say to you, beloved in the Lord, because they're not beloved in the Lord. Yeah. I'll be right up front with you. They're not precious to me. Mm -hmm. They have knocked me. I'm not talking about people that evidence a, a genuine interest in the Lord. I'm talking about the mass of them. So I, when I look at them, I don't, I weep. But, but it's not because I'm attracted to them. Because I know what's ahead for them, and I would to God they'd turn. Amen. Amen. Many conscientious believers have never been called a saint mm -hmm. or beloved or faithful. Yeah. They've never in all their life been addressed as though they were reconciled to God, as though they were brethren of Christ and heirs of God. They've never been addressed like that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but if they would, it'd be a great, uh, mm -hmm. great consolation to them. Well, with that in mind, let's proceed to the second verse. And to our beloved Aphia and our Kippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. <laughs> well, you see how personal Paul can get. Just imagine a letter coming to your house, Brother Tony's house, and it's from Paul. He says, I'm writing to a, a beloved Brother Tony, and to our beloved sister, Melissa. Yeah. Why, well, we'd have that letter be read in the assembly. Yeah. Amen. Well, that's, that's the way Paul was. Yeah. Now, this is a premier apostle. Mm -hmm. 
This isn't like a secondary member of the church in Jerusalem. This is probably the key person in the history of the world, numbered next only to Jesus. You see what kind of heart he had. Now, people have pondered who Aphia was. I'll just give you the prevailing idea which I, with which I agree. McClintock and Strong's Cyclopedia says, Aphia is the name of a female affectionately saluted by Paul in AD 50, 57 as a Christian in Colossae. She is supposed by Chrysostom and Theodoret to have been the wife of Philemon, with whom, according to tradition, she suffered martyrdom. Now, this is generally agreed among people that have spent the time to study this thing out with church history. You don't, you don't have to study it out for your... There's been people study this out already. Pulpit Commentary says, most commentators, particularly Chrysostom, which is one of the first century type people, among the ancients infer that Aphia was the life of Philemon, wife of Philemon. Otherwise, why mention her name here? Same view is held by John Gill, Albert Barnes, Matthew Henry, the International Standard Encyclopedia, and others. Joseph Beats adds, the connection suggests strongly that she was Philemon's wife, and this is the more likely because the letter deals with a domestic matter. And church history tells us that she was martyred, stoned to death, with her husband Philemon and Archippus under the reign of Nero. How substantial that is, I don't, but that's, that's, the, that's the picture. So I, I see no valid reason for uh, re objecting to this view. Aphia, our beloved, oh, our beloved Aphia. Other versions, like the tone it down in of NIV says, our sister. Yeah. Well, I don't like that. Yeah. One uh, Douay version says, our dearest sister. So, all right, they enhanced it a little bit. The word beloved is not a casual word, like, hey. <laughs> We got these dumb expressions today. Hey, you know, what's up? <laughs> Bunch of stupidity. These people are stupid. That's why they talk that way. You say, well, they have a lot of intelligence. Well, they smothered it somehow. This is bad communication. Beloved. Now, the word, <laughs> technical meaning of the word is esteemed, dear, favorite, favorite, and worthy of love. When Lexington says it means very much love, so this is, uh, Aphia excelled. Yeah, that's right. Beloved. This word beloved, it's used 62 times in the scripture, New Covenant scriptures, and it's never in a casual sense at all. It always has to do with one's identity with Christ. It's never used of a person of the world right. at all. It's always without regard to gender. This is, this is just for men or this is for women. Yeah. It's, not, it's always an exclusion of gender or any other kind of worldly distinction. So the application of the word to Aphia shows the high regard that Paul had for this sister. As the letter continues, we'll see it was related to the work of God. Because there was a they had a church in their house. Now there have been some misrepresentation of Paul's words. I want to take a moment to deal with this. Some have presented Paul as being against women. Some have used his writings to curtail the activities of women in the church. They forget that Jesus chose Paul because he considered him faithful. Mm -hmm. Amen. So he put him in the ministry. It's just the same way thing he said of Abraham. He knew he'll command his seed after him That's to keep right. the commandments. Yeah. See, he so, so Paul could be counted on to be faithful. So when he talked about women, he was like faithful. Yes, amen. When he talked about them. That is, he, he addressed them like God would uh, 
would address them. Paul did not think in terms of male and female when he's talking about the things pertaining to life and godliness. He didn't talk in terms of male and female. Well, sometimes he, well, he wasn't talking about the riches of God's treasures. He was talking about abuses. And he only did it two times, incidentally. And neither one was protracted or extensive. He knew that in Christ there is neither male nor female. So when he, when he came to loving the people of God, he didn't have one kind of love for the men and one kind for the women. He, that's not the way it was. Now Paul in his writings, he, did, he took time to mention particular women. Now, people that are against women, they don't mention women. I mean, I used to be among these people. I know what I'm talking about. In fact, I was, I was one of the people. So I know what I'm talking about. They don't talk about women. But Paul did. He talked about particular women connected with the work of God. Some names that come to mind, Priscilla, Phoebe, Mary, Junia, Tryphena, Tryphosa, Persis, Julia, and a sister of Nereus. He mentioned them in his epistles yeah. to the church, to the, to the aggregate people of God. He mentions these women. Yeah. Well, there's some men that have never mentioned a woman's name in the pulpit. Yeah. Just they accidentally read it in the Bible. <laughs> And there are women of Scripture, there are women of Scripture that are of note. There's Miriam, the sister of Moses. Micah says that God brought each, uh, God used Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to bring Egypt, uh, Israel out of Egypt. That's Micah 6 4. There's Deborah, the judge. There's Jochebed, Moses' mother who weaned him and gave him back to Pharaoh's daughter with a lot more information. There's Rahab. There's a woman of faith. There's Huldah the prophetess. There's a Shunammite woman who told her husband, we've got to make a little room for Elisha. He's coming, but the prophet's coming by here. Her husband didn't ask her. She told her husband, we're going to make this room. And it's like God said, hearken to the voice of your wife. Anna the prophetess, the four daughters of Philip. See, these are key women, and these are key women, kingdom women, yeah, amen. mentioned in the scripture. So God's by no means like anti-woman. There's well-known couples in the Bible. Here's about a husband and a wife we're talking about. Well-known couples. Noted for their faith is Abraham and Sarah. Both of them are in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11. There's Isaac and Rebecca. They concurred, you remember, about Jacob marrying a proper woman. There's Manoah and his wife. That's Samson's parents. They were united. There's Zacharias and Elizabeth. They together walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. There's Joseph and Mary. No disagreement on the hand of Jesus at all. And there's Aquila and Priscilla. So you see there's... Uh, just, these are just in the common. They're not making a particular point to these people. Just as they're talking about the things of God, they, may, they feel quite at liberty to mention women, mm -hmm. to mention uh, key women, to mention married people, mm -hmm. and couples. See, just in the common communication, they felt no restraint in doing this at all. So we don't either. Amen. I know there's some people that object to it. Mm -hmm. So what? To, to borrow a vulgar colloquialism, who cares? We feel free to talk in this same type of, like, type of language because we know people like this, yes? Yeah, I was thinking of um, our brethren in, in uh, Kenya, uh, the Mulele brethren. We think of them as Brother David and Sister That's Tekla right. together, you know. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, as I mentioned, it's... This is like a diversion I took a few minutes to take. But I thought it was necessary because there still remains like a cloud of under misunderstanding about this subject. Mm -hmm. And you might be surprised who still struggles with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
and there's no need to struggle for it. You're free, to, you're free to speak about godly women without your tongue in your cheek or having to say, yeah, but, and then only if, and things like that. Wherever you find a godly woman, give her credit. Amen. Say her name. Mm -hmm. Say how you appreciate her faith. Mm -hmm. That's the manner of the kingdom. Amen. Adamic distinctions... See, man, woman, those are Adamic distinctions. Out of Adam, there isn't any man and woman. That's right. <laughs> right. So if you get up high enough, there isn't any male or female, or bond or free, or Jew or Greek. None at all. So I, Aphia, our beloved Aphia, we're, we're addressing her. This letter's to you too, Sister Aphia. Yeah. And Archippus, our fellow soldier. There are two references to this brother in the scripture, Archippus, too. One in Colossians that was written about 57 to 59 A.D. And this letter was written about four to six years later. In the Colossian letter, there was a particular exhortation given to this man, Archippus. It's at the fourth chapter of the 17th verse. Say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Now some people say, There you are. Archippus is slacked off. Well, there's no put that, that doesn't mean he's slacked off. Let me spend just a little bit of time here. The fact that that exhortation was given did not mean Archippus was dragging his feet and not doing his ministry. The fact that Paul said to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith, the lay hold of eternal life, that didn't mean Timothy wasn't fighting the good fight of faith. Yeah, amen. Yeah. See, these words, these, these exhortations have to do with continuance, mm -hmm. not commencement. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. It's a continuing yeah. effort. To do these things. See, the fact, the fact that we're in a hostile world, we have the law of sin in our members, a treasure and earthen vessels. The devil is hounding us, principalities and powers are opposing us. That's why this exhortation is always con <coughs> take heed to your ministry. So I'm taking heed in the morning, take heed to your ministry. You take a break at lunch, take heed. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Take heed to your ministry. Mm -hmm. Get ready to go to bed. Fight the good fight of faith. See, yeah. it, see it has to do with keeping, mm -hmm. keeping that activity going mm -hmm. rather than starting it after you've letting it, let it fall. Amen. Now, this is the manner of falling. Yeah, amen. He take for granted that people are walking by faith. He doesn't yeah. ever assume anything. Yeah. Amen. He recognizes the liabilities that are present and, and are, uh, exhorts them that they might overcome it. Amen. It's yes. kind of like when we come together, if we ask one another, how's your faith? It's not that we're assuming that you don't <laughs> have right. any, yeah. but it's just, it's just a, it, it's like the manner of the It's kingdom. the manner. Some people conclude that. What do you mean? Are you saying I don't have any faith? No, we're saying if you don't take heed to it, you will, you won't. <laughs> All right, one of Babylon's significant failings is his perception of the ministry and work of the Lord. Now, I've been to a lot of ministers' meetings, a whole lot more than I, than I, than I have desired to be in and a part of. But I have never heard one minister say to another minister, take heed to your ministry or fight the good fight of faith or be strong in the Lord. I've never heard any kind of communication like that among these men. See, you would always hear this from Paul. Why? Because he knew, he knew what's going on in spiritual life. Yes, amen. He knew that the time you, the time you let your guard down, Satan will let you have one. Mm -hmm. You made a place for him. When I left the work over there in Oklahoma, I had a group of brothers that I met with. I considered them brothers. I cared very yeah. much about them. 
We met together on a regular basis and prayed and talked about some kingdom things. And, and when we left over there, I said something like this to them. Well, one of them took a mild offense at it <laughs> because he was not used to hearing That's someone right. concerned That's about right. his work and encouraging him to continue in it. And he said, what do you, you think we're not going to? Yeah. Well, he, see, you sowed a seed there. I said, well, not at all. I said, you, not at all. You sowed a seed, and his, if you turn hard, he probably thought about that sometime later and took it the right way. But that's, yes, <laughs> it's a sad thing, actually, you see, because I depend on words like this. Yeah. Amen. You brethren do, too. I depend on these constant stirring one another up. <clears throat> And to our Kippus, where this letter is written to to you, Philemon, and to beloved Aphia, and to our Kippus, our fellow soldier. Hmm. Now, some other versions read, a brother in God's army. Well, I don't like that. I mean, you could be in the army and be a secretary, you know. <laughs> a fellow soldier. That's what's out of a fighting line co-soldier or comrade who serves the Lord as we do, who serves with us in the Lord's army, and our fellow soldier in the Christian warfare. And I like that. That's amplified. But the others it seem to be a little bit too toned down. Now, he uses the word fellow soldier in another place, Paul does. Philippians 2.25 I suppose it necessary to send unto you Epaphroditus, my companion and companion in labor and fellow soldier. Uh -huh. Fellow soldier. The term means, sold fellow soldier. The term means an associate in labors and conflicts for the cause of Christ. So as someone's been in the trenches, so to speak, mm -hmm. yeah. with a bullet or a flying, or as scriptural as with the arrows or flying, the fighting's going on. Now we see uh, Paul's talked about being a soldier. Here's what he said in 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 5. Thou therefore endure hardness, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself, no man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life. No man does. No man at war. No man that's fighting gets caught up in the world. That's what he's saying. And the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, you learn how to use your bow and arrow or your gun or whatever you got. You learn how to use it. No, no man, no one who strives for masteries is crowned except he strive lawfully. So you got to fight lawfully, yeah. not in the flesh. Now we see several things in this word. Endure hardness as a good soldier. Endure hardness as a good soldier. Don't entangle yourself in the affairs of this life, so you can please him. He's chosen you to be. He's chosen you to be a soldier. He didn't choose you to sit down. He chose you to be a soldier. We see that a good soldier endures hardness. <laughs> now, a lot of people can't uh, hold up under hardness. Mm -hmm. Stress comes, they begin to murmur and mm -hmm. cry and things of that sort. They can't stand hardness. So a person who is enduring hardness at soldier, he's just not suffering uh, trouble, he's handling it in the right way. So yeah, we'd have to ask one another, do you handle your troubles in the right way? What do you do when things begin to be hard, when hardship, hardness is when hardship comes in. If you have doubts as to whether you are actually a good soldier, how do you hold up in this, under stress? I said before you are Kippus, Timoth, Timothy, and Philemon. They were called fellow laborers. They held up mm -hmm. under stress. Oh, it didn't mean they didn't have tears. Oh, they had tears. They didn't quit. Mm -hmm. 
somehow they always ended up on their feet. You know. So that's the kind of person Archippus was. He's a fellow soldier. He was in the battle, and he was fighting. You know, it's just like people, when they built the wall in Nehemiah's day, everybody had a sword in one hand, a trowel in the other. But you had to defend your part of the wall. It wasn't your job to go over, leap over to the other guy's wall and work. defend your part of the wall. Because if they break through your part of the wall, they got an entrance into the city. Now listen, brethren, there's some people. I wish you didn't have to say things like this, but there's some people that have let the devil in through their part of the wall. And they think it was just their personal business. Oh, no. Yet it defiled the entire assembly. That's right. Satan liked to get through. Maybe you just have a little old slot. You don't have much. You have just a little slot. But Satan, you, but you let Satan through there. Yeah. He got in among us. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. We hope that isn't the case now. But we've experienced things yeah. like this. I don't know if a lot of people have realized this, but in the middle of warfare, when you're right in the middle of the conflict and the enemy's rushing you, there is no time. Time out. You can't like say, "Wait a minute, yeah. I need to use the restroom now." I'm just gonna. I mean, every one of you recognizes that that time comes, and I mean that's crude, but this is the truth. Oh, yes, there is, is you, the, the normal things of life are suspended yeah. in the middle of this fight. Yeah. You don't entangle yourself that's right. in the affairs, the affairs right. of this life. Listen, I've seen this happen. There's a Fierce spiritual warfare going on. You can sense it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the time someone takes a vacation. Yeah. Yeah. That's their business. That's mm -hmm. to understand. But they got entangled yes, that's right. <laughs> in the affairs of this life. Mm -hmm. Even in the world, when a crisis comes up, they suspend their activity. Yes, that's right. Amen. Yeah. When you can see it as life and death, it changes everything. Oh, yeah. See, Archippus was a good, he was a soldier, a fellow soldier. You could bank on him to uh, follow through with these things. Another thing to say here, Brother Gibbon, is going through hardship doesn't necessarily mean you've done something wrong. Oh, no. Yeah. Remember Job, when he went through hardship, he was accused. That's right. That he'd done something wrong. Yeah. You know, when the That's apostles right. faced conflict, they were accused of being troublemakers. But that, that it could be the confirmation that you're doing something right. See, mm -hmm. you know, we've yeah. been in front of people, poor brethren, that didn't know the about inner warfare and this sort of thing. They didn't know about it, so they, the crisis came and they sat down and thought about how bad they were. But uh, we have a person that actually recovered from that. Yeah. Uh -huh. And now he's, he got it. when the crisis comes, he gets up on his feet and fights. Yes, amen. What's the difference? Good soldier. Mm -hmm. yep. Learn to endure hardness. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot of things that can make you discouraged. But it's your business not to let him do it. Amen. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Yes? This entanglement, also, um, someone who's not as mature or knowledgeable may think that you have to try and escape duties and necessities of life, not to be entangled yeah. mm -hmm. with the things of this life. But that's not the case either. You're doing those things as unto the Lord, so it's like you're escaping the realm where these things are able to entangle. That's yes. right. And I was just thinking the closer you get to the source of the mm. trouble, that's where it's entangling. That's good. So you stay farther away that's from good. it where you can labor in it profitably. Mm -hmm. Yes, amen. Yeah, the, it isn't that you avoid the affairs of this life. You avoid being entangled, confined to them, in other words. You, you're taken out of the battle to deal with this situation, yeah, right. thinking you're thinking you're dealing with something really critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, a good soldier, of course, doesn't do that. Brother Gibbon, these are also situations where the Lord's teaching you to manage. Mm -hmm. He's He's teaching you how to be a kingdom laborer and to manage. That's the, right. The things that are given to you to manage. That's whether right. It's, it's a trial or whether it's a duty or what you're learning how to reign. Amen. As you grow up into Christ, you realize that he's given you all the resources to having done all to stand. So it's, yeah. it's not like God's going to let a circumstance come on you that exceeds your ability. Amen. He's going on record. No, he won't, right. will not allow that to happen. There's a way of escape, a way to stand. 
The blessedness of those who are in fact enduring hardness is confirmed by this special recognition mm -hmm. Paul gives to precious souls. So we commend those of you, several of you, in the past year or so have endured some hardness. We've seen it. Amen. We commend you for it. Brought great glory to God. So Archippus, his letters to you too, even though it pertains to a, someone who wasn't your slave, but listen up now, what, what I'm going to say. And he's uh, finally, when I want I'm writing to the church that's in your house too. Church that meets in your home, in IV reads, the congregation that gathers in your home. Jerusalem Bible says, the assembly which is in thy house. Darby says, the assembly in thy house. The assembly which meets in Philemon's house, Montgomery, and the church assembly that meets in your house. Say, so we're not doing anything strange. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Well, what is a church? Now that we're, we address the subject, what, what, what is a church? The, church? the church that meets in your house. So what, what is a church? Well, that technical definition is it's a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into a public place in an assembly. Now, you, this can be for ignoble purposes, too. That mob that was in Ephesus, remember, shouting out for the space of two hours, great as Diana of the Ephesians, that was called in the Greek text a church. <laughs> but it, was, it wasn't the... This kind of church really was just an assembly that got out of hand. So it means it's a body of people called out from one place to another place where they meet together. That's what a technical meaning of assembly. Now they meet together because of the nature of things in Christ. The, the faith of Christ is a together Religion, if I might yes. use that phrase. They're one body, or the the word, uh, you've heard the word ecclesia for assembly. Ek means called out, and klesia means assembly. So it's a, it's a sim called out. It isn't just that we just happened to come to the same place. We were called That's right. away yeah. from our normal residence to this place of residence. People in Christ are one body in Christ, and everyone members one of another. So each one of us have like blood vessels and cells that extend to the other mm -hmm. people. As part of us have knit with the rest of God's people, Amen. or stated in a more precise manner. Yeah, the body of Christ and members in particular. So it's a, a disassembled body is in like the morgue somewhere. A disassembled body is not a living body. It's not. It's a assembled body. And then an assembled one isn't living unless the spirit animates it. Like, like those that valley of dry bones when they had flesh on them and everything, they were still dead. They were whole bodies, but they were still dead and had to have some... Some breath. Stated another way, they have gifts differing according to the grace given to them. Let's see this. I'm making a case for why they meet together. Every member has something that every other member does may not have. Uh -huh. That's right. So if they're not coming together, and everything God gives is needed. Amen. See, every gift he gives is something that's needed by, by his family. Is he distributes it, he distributes it because no person can contain it all. So this is the way God works with this, which otherwise would have been an unworkable situation. He gives some to this, some to that, some to the other, and they give it to the assembly, and then he puts it all together. That's the way it works. <coughs> Stated another way, these are spiritual gifts. Each person has a spiritual gift. Paul said, now concerning spiritual gifts, I don't want you ignorant on this. Yeah. 
See, I come from a group who didn't talk about spiritual gifts because then people would think you were Pentecostal if you talked about spiritual gifts. Well, I'm telling you the truth. This is what they thought. This is how they reasoned. This is what they said. Can't talk about that. Just saying we can't talk about election because then they'll think we're then they'll think we're we're leaving predestination. We can't talk about the keeping power of God because they'll think we're Baptist. Well, we confronted this all the time. Maybe some of you have, but some of us have confronted this all the time. But this is the strategy of the kingdom. You have a small vessel mm -hmm. compared to what's needed to contain what God has to give. Yeah. So this would have stymied anybody but God. This would have stymied them. Mm -hmm. They're too small. They can't contain it all. So we'll either have to just like give them a little bit for this year and something else for next year. And But this was no problem with God. What he chose to do was I'll give what that person can hold and I'll give what that person can hold. Yeah. Then I'll get them together and they'll get to talking about it. Yeah. And then everybody will get in on it. Amen. And it'll come together in their minds. Mm -hmm. yes. It'll come together. Because truth has no effect until it comes, comes together. Paul said the manifestation of the Spirit, because God gives the gifts, but the Spirit is the one that mm -hmm. hands them out. This is taught in 1 Corinthians 12, mm -hmm. yeah. 7. The stated purpose of the gifts is the manifestation of the gift is given to every man to profit with all yeah. or to profit everybody. So Frank got the manifestation of the Spirit in the form of a gift so that the whole congregation mm -hmm. could get it. Yes. Otherwise, I just have to give the whole congregation one thing today and give the whole congregation one thing tomorrow and hope they can finally get it all together. But that's not the way God works. Yeah. See, I'm making a case for why the church comes together. Because yeah. <laughs> the church is a together, that's a together term. The church isn't the church like out there. Mm -hmm. It's together, the assembly. Because of the unlimited measure of the resources and the limited measure of the ones who contain them, mm -hmm. we're going to have to fill the house with jars. Yes. Uh, <laughs> See, right? like, that, like that widow woman. She didn't have a jar big enough to contain enough oil to pay off her debt. Amen. But she got enough little jars of jars of sorted size that she got enough of them, uh -huh. she could get enough oil to pay the debt. The church is that way. No single person has a jar big enough to contain what God has to give. Yes. But if you put them all together, they'll all get something, and then they'll get, each person will get like the summation of it yes. and the significance of it. Will burst upon the soul. Given, I, can, I can testify that sometimes I just I'll see just a little part of it. Yeah. But if I'm if I'll say it, yeah. well, the brother will start talking, and I'll actually go away That's with right. a greater understanding. But now anybody in their right mind that would understand this arrangement you've just outlined, why would they possibly want to stay away I, from this benefit? Yeah, I know it. Well, like, yes, this is a hard question. Yes. Now let's ask a hard thing. <laughs> Brother Given, this is also a way of confirming that God does dwell in us of a truth. That's right. Yes. If Amen. we love one another, yes. God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in Amen. us. Amen. 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 I trust I, you can all see this, but this, I still feel like I just have seen the border of the border of the promised land in this matter. And how to, uh, I'm working on how to say it, but... The strength of seeing the truth is when you see the summation or the bottom total of the truth. All right, now, you, now we know, for instance, that the nation is three, four, I guess, I forget how many trillion we're in now, but we're in the trillions of dollars. Let's just say four, four trillion dollars in debt. But see, I can't make sense out of that bottom line. But now, if someone would voice the the details of it, mm -hmm. I can see well, how it added up to that down there, see. Yeah. Now, here's what happens in the body of Christ. There's apostolic statements that are made 
If God be for us, who can be against us? All right. So pretty soon one member of the body speaks a little something that God's given him. Another member speaks what God's given her. Pretty soon we can see that add up to it. Yes. Oh. Amen. Right. All things are of God. If God be for us, who can be against us? It all adds up. Yeah. That's when you've got the truth. Yeah. When it all adds up, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's when you got it. Yeah. But you got it from different sources you might say ultimately one source i understand now this is why the body meets together for edification it's not the individual the individual is to be is to grow up we understand that but over and above that the church has got to grow up the church has got to be mature because the church not the individual is the pillar and ground of the truth when he said, ye are the light of the world, he said, ye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why I like them, the old English, because you can tell the plural from the singular. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, John, you are the light of the world. He said, ye, yeah. collectively, right. are the light of the world. You personally aren't. Mm -hmm. There's a little chorus we used to sing, brighten the corner where you are. Right. That's, that's the best you can do. Mm -hmm. Brighten the corner where you are. But see, the church, it can... The world. It can illuminate the world. So a gathering, in other words, salvation makes people fit to gather together to build one another up and get ready to be Christ's bride. But I got to get down to the, kind of the bottom line. That's what it's all about. So conversion makes you suitable to fit in with the other members of the body because Christ's bride is going to be the whole body, not, not one of us. It's going to be the whole body. But we've got to contribute to one another because that's the way God, it has to be because of human weakness. That's how it has to be. It has to be you get some, he gets some, she gets some. But then we can, God will help us in our mind, add it all up and come to the right conclusion. Yes, Sister Sydney. When you were talking about um, knitting together, I thought of a puzzle um, yeah, that's right. Every, it needs all the pieces to make that's, the picture out. Right? That's right. Amen. That's exactly it. All right, now this is, if what I've said is, is true, then a body of people that meet together that don't edify each other really is not a church. Not a church. It's a, it's a group. That's all. It's about the best it is. Well, I tell you, once you see this, we got a pretty, pretty big church. Yeah. Amen. We got a bigger church if you just count the nucleus than some churches that are up in the thousands. Yeah. That's right. Couldn't get this many people out Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you the truth. Yeah. Some people shut out on Sunday night. They couldn't get this many people out. Mm -hmm. see? Well, it's questionable mm -hmm. whether that's a church or not. Yeah. If what we've said is true. <clears throat> the church which is in thy house. So one of these gatherings met in Philemon's house. Now the book of Colossians contains reference to Archippus. It also mentions Onesimus, who was a member there, who uh, was Philemon's slave. That, together with the general tenor of the letter, has led many to believe, and I'm one of them, that the Colossian church met in Philemon's house. That's where the Colossian brethren met. And because Philemon is uh, commended for helping the saints and ministering to the saints and he had a slave, so it was obviously a man of means, suggests that he had a, like a significant dwelling. Like when we were in the uh, eastern part of the world, they would have a house and they'd have a court mm -hmm. yeah. inside there that people would meet. So uh -huh. a lot of people could meet in a, in a house. Oh, yeah. Now, many affirm that the early church met in houses. If you've read many people, they, they will say that. The early church always met in houses. Well, see, this is not 
This is not true. The scriptures don't say this. The early church met in the temple and from house to house. Paul assembled the brethren in Ephesus at the school of Tyrannus. People who hosted the church in their house, that's mentioned in Scripture, include Aquila and Priscilla had a church in their house, Nymphus had a church in his house, and Philemon had a church in his house, and I think that's the only three that are mentioned. So I don't know, based on those three, why anyone would say the early church always met in the homes. I don't, I don't know the basis of such a remark as that. Because the early church wasn't small. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. Church of Jerusalem, before we get several chapters, it's, all, it's already up of nearly 10,000. Yeah. 3,000 right off the bat, and the second 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Mm -hmm. Then multitudes are added, so we ask, they estimate that a very, very reasonable number would be 20,000, mm -hmm. maybe 30,000. Large numbers of large numbers of the priests. So it was a significant body of people. But that they never got together at one time? Well, you just have to have a place that could, yeah. they could house them. Now, the scriptures do speak about the whole church coming together into one place. i give you some text there. The whole, all the brethren come together at one time in one place. That's when the body yeah. starts to work. That's when it's built up. Mm -hmm. Paul represented this scenario of the church, whole church came together in one, one place. Stranger come in, you know, everybody starts to prophesy. The, God's revealing things to the members. They're, they're speaking. God's addressing this stranger. Yeah. Nobody in the congregation apparently knew it. And finally, Stranger falls down and he confesses, God is in you or among you, we'd say. God's here. Mm -hmm. We ask ourselves the question when we meet, is God here? Mm -hmm. If he's not here, let's just not proceed any further. Let's address that matter first. Uh -huh. Is God here? How do you know God's here? It's not by a feeling. It's by these contributions. Mm -hmm. That's how you know. You say, oh, boy, that was good. That was sure good with Brother so-and-so. said, get, oh, yeah. what that sister so-and-so said, what is that? Yeah. That's confirmation that the Lord's among Amen. us. Ministering yeah. through the various parts of the body. Of course, you remove these ministrations. I don't know if you could make a successful case for having to meet together. Yeah. If you remove these contributions, if you remove the members of the body contributing the jo joints and bands, contributing, ministering, as the Lord speaks. If you, if you take that out of the picture, mm -hmm. I don't know that you could confirm that you there's a need to meet together. Uh, yeah. yeah, Brother Gibbon, I was thinking about, you know, we come together and, and normally you have a bulletin and we have arranged certain things, yeah. certain things, but what that is is like a springboard for these, <laughs> these, 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 um, That's these, right. uh, Things to happen. So, I mean, it is like we sit here and just look at each other and, and hope that something happens. Yeah. So, so there are some things that have been pre-planned, yeah. pre-prepared, and order that yeah. these these expressions will will surface, and, and the Lord will be able to work through them decently and in order. And as long as far as the the thousands of people coming together, the Jews had been tutored in this. They had been That's taught. Right. That they come together yeah. during these feast times? Yeah. So they were very good at right. planning these types of events. <laughs> you just think of this. When they came out of Egypt, they had to all come out together. They crossed the Red Sea. They had to all cross it together. They journeyed to the Promised Land. They all had to journey together. <laughs> when they were punished, they were punished together. <laughs> yeah. So there's advantages to it. And God places the members in the body as it pleased him. And there's, well, he's in charge of who gets into the assemblies. Yeah. Amen. And our job is to recognize it. It's our job. Whenever someone is profitable, you never want to question the presence of that person. Mm -hmm. Someone isn't profitable, we work at making them profitable, but that's got to happen at some point. So you see, the, 
that all of this is seen in the way Paul addressed this letter to Philemon, to Aphia, and to Archippus, who's on the front lines battling with us. I think I'll, I'll close there. Any of you have a word you'd like to add tonight? about um, what you said about the profitability of the uh, assembly and how the ones that have left have been the ones who didn't enter into any of that that, <laughs> that weren't um, engaged in this and, yeah. you know so it wasn't profitable for them yeah mm -hmm. that's why they left it wasn't a profit of them so it makes it, it makes it you want to examine yourself to say you know am I profiting uh, yeah. the body and am mm -hmm. I being profited by it by yeah. engaging in, in, in this because this is a warfare doing this too because oh, yeah. we're battling off these thoughts mm -hmm. uh, that, that could take over your mind sometimes mm -hmm. if, you, if you're not able to uh, understand these things and reason on them and, and uh, See, you know, <coughs> get them and keep them you only give what you've received yeah, that's right. so it isn't like we're, that we set a standard that yeah. It, that's not it. You you give what you've received, mm -hmm. and if you, if you've received comparatively a small amount to what someone else receives, that does not mean it's insignificant. Yeah, right. This may be like a diamond. Yeah. Amen. Uh -huh. That's right. And yeah, someone had a pound of iron ore. You know which which one is most valuable. Yeah, that's right. So uh, yes, every whatever you have, whatever you can see. Well, I've seen brother, brothers and sisters. I've seen many of you get advanced in this. You stand up here and you say things that maybe a year ago you couldn't have said. Mm -hmm. But the more, but you, some of that's traced back to the fact that you you spoke it out. Mm -hmm. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, Jesus said. Mm -hmm. And you're becoming more and more proficient in it, and it, and we're getting more and more edified by it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. yeah, it's a Yeah, I appreciate. The way you brought this out concerning Aphia and um, how Paul was, was forward to mention the sisters in mm -hmm. Scripture. And we know that, that Paul didn't just do this to kind of make them feel included. He did this because he saw in them Christ. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and I just want to thank the Lord publicly for giving the sisters here a platform to be able to yes. speak. Mm -hmm. Because I remember um, being in environments in the past where I wanted to be able to to contribute in that manner but I couldn't mm -hmm. because there wasn't there wasn't it wasn't made available mm -hmm. and so I'm grateful because as, as you just said you grow when you speak that's right because mm -hmm. it, it it helps you to tune your thinking that's good on the matter that's good and, tune your thinking. and then you're able to articulate <laughs> mm -hmm. and the Lord's able to, to cause you to grow up into Christ in this area amen mm -hmm. Silas Yes, I liked whenever you talking about the word beloved. I liked when you said the, the word was only mentioned with one's identity in Christ. That's why it was never used in a casual sense. Yeah, Amen. that's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right. See, so we try and avoid casual terms as much as possible. I mean, you we don't we don't want to border on the ridiculous here, but anytime anything is casual or general, it tends to deteriorate. If what you say, I've heard a lot of preaching in my day that was very general. It really was general, like like birdshot. You know, it didn't really it scattered all over the place, but it didn't really bring any game home. Generality tends to do that. Specificity, it stays with you longer when it's... You can take something general and you can shout it, you know, but people still forget it. <laughs> but when you've got members of the body, that wars against generality and that, that kind of thing. It wars against it. Amen. Yes, Ricky. Also, what you say to somebody, you're appealing to some aspect of their person. You can, mm -hmm. you can talk in a way to appeal to the old man. Oh, yes. You know, generalizations, that casual talk, that appeals more to the old man. That's right. I like what you said in the opening about 
about us affirming who we are in Christ because, see, that appeals to the new man. Amen. You don't know what a person's gone through. You know, maybe they're battle weary. They've got, they're a soldier and they've been battle weary. And, yeah. and so they just need this, you to speak to their faith, to encourage yeah, their amen. hearts. And just to say a word of them being a saint just kind of. It kind of bolsters you, Amen. To, refreshes your spirit. So <laughs> it's good for us to all be to be very cautious and mm -hmm. and Amen. What part of the person are we appealing to when That's we're right. talking? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, and casualness lends itself to confusion. Uh -huh. Yes, it when, does. And, yes, it I mean, does. We've all we've all partaken of both both parties, <laughs> yes. if you will. Uh -huh. Um, I just know in, in reading some of the brethren that have gone on to be with the Lord, like Spurgeon or others, they're very specific. Yes, and, right. when they, and so it's clear, and your faith is able to grab yeah. a hold of that. And when you read things maybe that are written today, they're very casual. And it's very confusing yeah. as to Amen. what they're trying to say. Mm -hmm. See, when, you, when a person is first becoming accustomed to speaking publicly, it takes some preparation. You, but you're 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 disciplining your flesh, and you're it's not a it's not a like a law thing. It's not that sort of thing. It's that you're learning how to speak, and as you're learning to speak, you're learning to edify yes, and to comfort, right. see, and to exhort, and yes. all of these various things that are that are the results of speaking. You're participating in that. When you you have to learn to do this. It's part of growth. In the sister speaking, I, I, I was, I'm very thankful for the the sobriety that, that they put into it. There's not any. Oh, yeah, you know, I, I've only had a couple of people in all the videos that we put up on YouTube and stuff that are, have even contested it. And of those, I've never had one to be able to, to answer this challenge. I told them, you listen to what they say. And come back to me and if there's any doctrinal errors, we'll talk about them. Yep. And I haven't had one person Amen. come back, which tells you that they spoke with sobriety. Yeah. They spoke, you know, with what, like you said, with what they've seen of the scriptures. That's right. And scripture is always the theme, yeah. so serious people receive it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mister Barb. I like this illustration that you helped us to see about the woman gathering the vessels into her home. Yeah. Yeah. And that each of us are not large enough to hold yeah. the fullness mm -hmm. that the Lord has to give. I was considering as as we dwell together, we share these things and we're, we are enlarged. Our vessels are Amen. enlarged. Amen. But we still are enlarged to the, the place where we're able to hold the fullness. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about another picture in the scriptures. It's when, when we're gathered together and Jesus is working in the midst, he's changing that water into wine. Yeah. Yeah, that's he's good. It, he's Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 Yeah. Hey, you'll, never, you'll never be big enough to not need the other vessels yeah. mm -hmm. in this world. Uh -huh. Well, I'm not sure you will in the next either for that matter. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's only one in whom God was that's pleased right. to have all this That's right. That's right. Amen. Amen. And it's of his fullness that we have received. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Anyone else tonight? <clears throat> Yes, Sister Bailey. Considering in the beginning when you talked when you were talking about how um, today how people address um, the brethren, how people address each other, um, I was considering um, you were talking about Babylon and how the Christ warned of um, people being deceived in uh, Matthew 24. He said that take heed that no man deceive you. So it's important for us to um, realize, um, like in, in the beginning of these letters, it may seem like nothing when it says into our beloved, but it's very important, and mm -hmm. as you said, it is an encouragement to brother and to hear. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Now, haven't you found it uh, to be so that when you recognize who the people of God are, you speak more carefully to yes, them? Amen. Right? Right. Because you know that, like, God has given you access to them mm -hmm. to contribute to their faith. So, yeah, it, it was a sobering mm -hmm. consideration. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the saints that are mentioned in Scripture and for the confirmation that individuals that have tasted of the grace of God and have received spiritual abilities and insights, they deserve a hearing from us. And we thank you. You've given us quite a number of these kind of people. We thank you for it, Father, and pray that you would increase our ability to express and our ability to discern. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat>